it's a competition clinching shot. The LET Golf Podcast, the official podcast of the Ladies European Tour. Hello and welcome to episode two of the LET Golf Podcast. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, this is the brand new show from the Ladies European Tour, where each week we take you inside the ropes of the LET to chat to the stars of the show. I'm George Cooper, back again after an eventful second week of the season, and I'm delighted to be joined once more by media official and LET encyclopedia, Nicola Kenton. Nicola, how are you today? I'm good, thank you, George. How are you? Very good, yeah. Fresh off the back of what was a really exciting weekend in the end uh, over in Morocco. So yeah, I'm buzzing, buzzing for the new season. It was a great week. Um, what did you think of the golf? It was great to see uh, some new players again from this year coming up, some rookies that were involved, and obviously the stalwarts from last year <laughs> rising to the top of the table again. And um, last week's guest, Maya Stark, happened to come out on top at the Lala Merriam Cup, winning on Saturday evening. Uh, so if you haven't listened to last week's podcast yet, make sure to catch up on episode one to hear from the now six time LET champion. Um, but yeah, no, it was great. Talk me through what you saw out there, George. Obviously you were at the course. Yeah. Yeah. I was just about to say, you should chat to chat to Maya on the podcast before every tournament, because you're clearly a good luck charm. Um, but yeah, dominant performance in the end for Maya. She won by four shots. Um, although it doesn't tell the whole story really. I mean, we had ourselves a really exciting weekend. I mean, top three in the end, Maya Stark, Lingran, Aditi Ashok, who was obviously the winner at the Magical Kenya Open. So it was a star-studded field, really. All the LET stars up there. Um, Linnea Strom got off to a really good start. Uh, she was leader after day one. Um, and then Maya came charging, really. She had a 67 on round two um, and then a 69 on the third round to win by four shots. Um, but the final day was really exciting. I mean... She was playing with Aditi. She bogeyed the first. Aditi birdied the first. So they were both locked on seven under. And you thought, hang on, they're gonna have a there's gonna be a showdown here. It was poised to be to be really to be really exciting. But in the end, Maya just just stormed through three birdies on the front nine. Then Lin came. I mean, it was all the week was sort of billed as oh, the return of Lin Grant and Maya Stark. Like, can they renew their rivalry from last year? And they certainly did. Like they went toe to toe right to the end again. Um, Lynn went on absolute birdie run on the back nine, and then she just sadly got halted. I think it was the bogey on uh, on 16, uh, which sort of derailed her momentum. And, and Maya's a six-time winner in the end. So yeah, brilliant week in Morocco. Really fun event as well. Obviously, you had uh, the men's event going alongside it on the PGA Champions Tour. I mean, it was just really cool. Like I was going onto the range, and there was like Miguel Angel Jimenez and Colin Montgomery, Bernard Langer were all there, and then you had like Manon de Roy. Uh, Gabby Ruffles like in between um, and I was like this is amazing and exactly what golf needs I mean I know we're getting more and more of these sort of events we had it at the Australian Open we obviously had the we've got the Scandinavian mix which obviously they're competing alongside each other but I think the more of these sort of mixed events is just it's just good for the game of golf so yeah really ex- really exciting week uh, really enjoyed it and and you know we had a we had a great finish Maya Stark now a six-time winner so yeah absolutely brilliant as you say, we move straight on. Tour life never stops. <laughs> straight to the next tournament. No. Um, we're in Saudi Arabia this week um, for a historic week for the LET. Let's talk through that. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. I mean, it's the first time ever the men's and women's purse is going to be exactly the same. So they're, they're fighting for a $5 million purse this week uh, with the winner getting 750000 which is just unbelievable for the game of golf, really. Um, so, yeah, we're off to Jeddah. Um, for the third event of the season and, and the stars are coming out aren't they Nicola? Yeah it's a star-studded field as you say the makeup of the field this week's a little bit different so we've got 120 players which is 60 LET members 50 players from the Rolex rankings top 300 in the world so anyone in the top 300 could enter and potentially get a spot and it happens that the players we got are the 50 best from the top 300 and 12 of those are from the top 20 in the world rankings. So it's an absolutely stacked event. Plus we've got 10 invites, which include a lot of LET members as well. So major champions are plenty. There's 11 players having won 16 majors between them, teeing it up this week. Obviously we've got Lynn as reigning race across the household champion alongside Ataya Titical who won in 2021 and Emily Christine Pedersen who won in 2020 so full of order of merit champions as you mentioned Aditi's a flying start to the season so she'll be one to watch again this week as the current race to Costa del Sol leader 
And yeah, it's just set to be a really exciting week here at Royal Greens. It's the seventh tournament that the LET has had here. So um, a lot of the players are kind of used to the course and how it plays. So we'll, we'll see what happens this week. Definitely, yeah. It's going to be a really exciting week. And uh, I think that takes us nicely on to our, our guest for this week, actually. Um, so you mentioned her just there. We mentioned her at the start of the show because she had a phenomenal uh, first week uh, in Morocco. So it's uh, going to be the Order of Merit winner from last year, um, four-time champion Lynn Grant, who we've got this week. And, uh, well, hopefully for her, you work as a good luck charm again. I think you did with Maya. Um, so Lynn's going to be our guest. Um, yeah, introduce us, please. Yeah, so I spoke with Lynn before she went to Morocco, so just before the season started, our reigning Race to Costa del Sol champion. Uh, last year, she became the fifth player to win the Race to Costa del Sol and Rookie of the Year titles in the same year and joined the likes of Dame Laura Davies, Carlotta Saganda, Esther Henselite and Ataya Titkal. So we covered some topics, including her plans for golf, her dreams of life after golf, what she does when she's not at the golf course. So what did Lynn do last year when she wasn't playing on the LET? She gives us a bit of insight about that, what motivates her and of course her historic year last year. So take it away. Hello Lynn and welcome to the LET Golf Podcast. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Have you had a good break since we saw you at the end of last season? Yes, I took um, all of December off, didn't touch a club, and then now I'm in Spain trying to prepare for the season. We'll start off with obviously reflecting on your 2022 season and everything that happened last year. Um, so has it sunk in now, kind of how much you achieved during 2022? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think it probably ever will. Um, I think I just, I think I see it as if I just played, you know, my game and done whatever I, uh, score-wise or result-wise, what I thought was possible. And then obviously I had a good season, but um, everything that's come with it, like trophies and exemptions and, you know, um, has just been, you know, added to what I thought was possible, sort of. So that's why I think I, I think I feel like I have to have this feeling about what happened, you know, like everyone's asking me like, oh, amazing, how do you feel? I'm like, I feel just as I did a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm just trying to, I don't want to forget about it because it's, you know, it's always nice to play well and do well. But on the other hand, I can't be stuck in what happened last year. You know? Yeah, for sure. And in terms of some of the highlights from your 2022, obviously we spoke at the end of last year, but talk me through some of the best moments of last year. I think winning my first LET in Joburg was like a great start. I mean, playing the Sunshine events and then getting that as well um, was just so such a great start. And um, then like halfway through playing the Scandi Mix, the winning that was such a crazy experience. I think that's like one of those moments where when I was younger or maybe a couple of years ago, I thought like that's one of those moments where you want to be. Mm -hmm. And then when I was in that, I could really like actually just enjoy it and think of like this is the moment that I've always like thought that I would be in. So that was just really, really cool. And then everything that came with that. Um, I mean, obviously winning at home again at Skafta was also just really nice. I, I love playing at home. And I think that kind of <laughs> kind of brings um, a good momentum for the week, I guess. And would you say that you're a home person? Do you love being in Sweden and being around Sweden? Yeah, I think so. Um, I didn't think that I was before, but um, I mean, since traveling so much the last, I mean, two or three years, I feel like I'm, I don't miss home, but I feel more comfortable. Like I can be <laughs> myself without anyone like judging. <laughs> um, I feel like the the more like taking the step from amateur to professional in golf, I feel like the professional me like becomes my job and my role. And so whenever I'm home, I feel like I can be the private me which is just really important. Obviously, winning the Race to Costa del Sol, Rookie of the Year and Players' Player of the Year all at once. You're one of the few people 
to have achieved that um, and obviously joined the likes of Attire and Carlotta, Dame Laura Davies, Esther in winning a couple of those titles at the same time. Um, did, do you kind of count the accolades when you receive them? Do you go, oh yes, this is something for the bank or are accolades just something that come along with the titles that you get? I guess I'm more motivated with like the process of golf getting my own goals um, checked off than collecting trophies, I guess. So even if, let's say, Scandinavian mix and I, let's say someone would have passed me on the, the leaderboard and I would have ended up second or third, I would still be, like, very happy with that week. It just happened to be, you know, that no one did. Um, so I, I try to, like, look at that that way instead of being, like, super overwhelmed with it. Because I think that can be tough to really like go week for week to just continue playing well will be very difficult if I was just stuck in with trophies and, you know, <laughs> and all that. And is that something that you've kind of had to learn as a professional? Obviously winning so early in the Sunshine Tour and then on the LET, having to kind of remember those moments but also put it behind you at the same time moving on week to week because as you say tour life is so fast (laughs) that sometimes it's difficult I feel like I'm I'm like very good at appreciating the win like that day or the day after or the weekend after really celebrating it in my way and feeling like emotionally done so whenever next week comes I don't feel like oh I should have stayed in that moment for a bit longer or I should have just uh, cherished that a bit more I feel like I I do that but just I just don't show it on Instagram or you know um I just see it as a good check and I talk to the people that I that I like and I trust and and what was good what was bad how could we do better so like I still feel like I um, emotionally I'm done with the week In Spain, we spoke a little bit about how you did transition from being an amateur to a pro and kind of the nerves that you had when you're going through that process. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, taking that leap and kind of knowing where your game is as an amateur, but then suddenly golf is where you're getting your money from and you're having to depend on it? Yeah, I think it was really hard because I saw so many like players that I used to look up to when I was younger that took that step and um, both girls and guys and and they just didn't perform the way they used to do as amateurs and so I think I obviously I tried to look at them and see what they did that didn't work out or try to figure out like how come they didn't perform the way that they did before and I think it all came down to like because it's everything is so new so like I really try to hold on to the things that I could and do the same things. For example, like not changing my club sponsor the year I turned pro or and not, not move from Sweden to another country or stuff like that. So still have like things that I knew and I was comfortable with and um, I knew my way around sort of because it was going to, everything was going to be new on the LT or the LPJ, whenever, wherever I went um, and like, having so much more responsibility of of everything outside of golf so again I just tried to hold on to people and things that I knew worked for me and not change too much that I needed to change just um the things that was I don't know um necessary I guess and how important have your family been in that aspect of it having your mom and your dad and your brother and Pontus around you uh well very much I mean obviously um both my dad Jonathan my brother and Pontus have caddied for me on and off for the whole year which has been really nice and I think that's also why it's been easy to transition from being an amateur um not like having to have someone new on the bag that I didn't know or take responsibility for when I didn't even know how to take responsibility of myself I guess um so it's that but also like my dad helps me out a lot with everything that goes on behind the scenes of golf so financially um but also like planning helping me plan my schedule 
booking all my flights and all my hotels and everything so that I can just play golf which is so nice because not everyone has that and it's like now it's the first time I realized where it's like oh my gosh can you imagine all these players that do this themselves and they still play good every week which is so impressive because I would I would probably quit after a year if I had to do that all by myself yeah so at least for me because I don't have that I don't have a I don't feel like it's necessary for me to know everything all the time I don't have to have control of all the bookings and everything so um, I've just let that go to someone that I trust <laughs> and so I can just focus on what I'm I'm good at instead so yeah, I'm not gonna miss out on my mom obviously she has a big part in it as well Um I feel like when whenever I come home or whenever I'm going out to play she's the first one and the last one I I talk to all the time and and she's obviously the the person I can talk more about my private self and what happens in my life outside of golf and feelings and and all that stuff that's important as well. And growing up obviously I imagine golf was always a big part of your life because of your family and your dad specifically and um, Talk me through that and when was the first time that you played golf? Well, I don't remember the first time, <laughs> actually, but I just remember that, uh, I mean, obviously my dad played when I was growing up and um, you used to go out to the golf course with him and in the beginning not playing golf at all, just hanging out with friends or the other golfers that had dogs with them or I had ice cream, I was riding the buggy um my golf club is right by the water so we would go swim like all those stuff that doesn't include any golf <laughs> probably at all and um, unfortunately my grandfather who passed away in 2006 before I even started thinking about golf he was a great coach apparently and um, it's not as if I feel like I have golf in my blood <laughs> but it's really fun to hear you know people that I've taken lessons from him or he used to be a coach in my home club for a very long time so a lot of the members have uh, practiced with him mm-hmm. so I feel like I would never change like my home club because it's so it's a big part of um, my family history I guess. So did you and your brother both play golf when you were growing up? Yeah and my brother I mean he's six years older than me so obviously he was a bit ahead <laughs> but uh, he used to play like in the elite junior group or what do you call it at my club and uh, tournaments and later on I played those tournaments Um he stopped playing when he was in high school to focus more on school um, and um, yeah but he still comes out with me sometimes and practices and we have some games and he gets frustrated and I try to help and <laughs> all that. And did you play any other sports when you were younger? I think I've tried pretty much everything but I uh, I used to ride horses for a really long time so I still try to go whenever I can and um, other than that I tried out yeah like I said pretty much everything um, but nothing stuck table tennis I did for a, for a while in school and stuff like that but yeah probably horses they they're still here around <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> did you used to do competitions or did you just ride horses for the love of it? Yeah no just for the love of it Um just that I, I just like their company for some reason. Speaking of horses, I know um, that when you're done with golf, you would like to have some horses and, you know, live live a quiet little life. I'd always love to be like living a bit on the countryside, not far away from the city, but countryside, have um, a bit of a farm. I don't know what animals exactly I would have, but a bit of everything, I guess. Um, and horses, obviously. Even though you're so fresh still, obviously, in your professional career, do you kind of think about when golf potentially might end? I know that sounds strange being obviously two years into your professional career, but you always have to have a plan of some sort. Is that something you have thought about or is that just you've got this ideal of what you want it to be, but you're nowhere near there? Um, I mean, I have a plan for it and I think I think about it at least once every week because I think I... When I grew up, I thought that I golf needed to be like my main goal. Like it needed to be like my only source of motivation. (laughs) 
which is not it, sometimes it's my least like the the last source of motivation that I have uh, to choose from so I mean having that long-term goal of like I don't know 10 15 20 years I don't know when like you're saying but just having that like that horse and and the picture of like how I would like to live um and all that and what that requires both personally economically everything I think that's very motivating and trying to like more figure out like how would I want my life to look in 15 years okay and how can I affect that today so that's probably my biggest motivation when it comes to anything I do I think. It's useful to hear that because as I said not everyone has that plan well in advance but the fact that you've paid so much attention to it shows that yes you care about what you're doing now but you also care about what you're going to do afterwards Mm. in in a sense is that something that your parents kind of drilled into you or is that something you've just kind of done yourself I mean obviously the planning ahead comes from my dad I guess um the most but like just knowing that um like the life that I have had when I grew up was I mean very fortunate you know um having a great family and house and like I could play golf I could travel not everyone can do that and I'm just thinking like if I want to have kids or if I want a family I want them to feel the same Um, not saying that they're going to be spoiled but I want them to have opportunities and if I can have that as a goal while doing the thing that I love the most then that's just like a huge bonus I think. I didn't used to think like that. It was probably in college that I more started working with uh, Marcus, one of my coaches, like my mental coach. And he was like, I think it's really important to have goals for like personal goals for your life or how you want to be as a person and um, what you want to achieve outside of golf. It could be really anything. But what stuck to me was like this picture of how my life's going to be in 15 or 20 years what I want to work with and that's why I also think that I don't want to play golf until I'm like 45 like the the absolute <laughs> most perfect plan would be to do like maximum 10 years really really well uh, and then have the option to not play anymore not just saying like economically but just have the option to do other things that I think are fun and um, yeah and speaking of outside of golf what does Lynn Grant do outside of golf? So in, in December, when you didn't touch a club, were you just spending time with friends? Obviously, we had Christmas, so a little yeah. different because that's a big celebration. But what do you do if you do not touch a club for a weekend or a week? <laughs> we did go skiing for a week. I don't do that in June, obviously, but <laughs> this year we did. Um, just hang out with, like, my family, obviously Pontus's family for Christmas, like you said, we lay puzzles um, we go for walks. Sometimes we go mushroom hunting. Um, the week before playing Scandinavian Mix, we went to a festival. Um, so I try to like put in things that I look forward to outside of golf during like the season as well. Um, I mean, obviously December was just a rest month. So some days I just woke up, saw a friend, <laughs> went home, talked to my family, you know, just seeing the people that I, I like and not doing too much. Just having one of those days where I could just go down to the bakery, buy breakfast, go home, have breakfast for like three hours and then, you know, um, see a friend, go to the gym, come home see my family have dinner go to bed I mean it's not it's not more difficult than that um on like a December I'm so done with the golf year so to say um mushroom hunting (laughs) (laughs) that like foraging for mushrooms that you can eat or um I don't know I guess it's maybe just a Swedish thing I don't know it's just (laughs) um, (laughs) like you go out in the woods to like find some mushrooms I guess <laughs> but I never find any so I'm very unlucky oh. <laughs> not very good at it no I don't know where to look apparently who tells you that Pontus <laughs> uh, yeah well Pontus is so funny like because he could go out with like a book and find every mushroom and be like oh this I can't eat or this I can't eat and and um, I tried to just look for one very specific one and I never find it which one like the red one with the white on 
No. <laughs> <laughs> Do you call them chanterelles in English? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the gold of the forest. So I always go and buy them instead. <laughs> <laughs> always looking for the best things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned going to the bakery, getting breakfast, and then eating breakfast for three hours. What What is that breakfast? You know, I mean, obviously not eating for three hours, but just like, a very chill morning. I would just go down to the bakery and buy some like breakfast, uh, what do you call it? breakfast buns? Is that what you say? And just yeah, go home, have breakfast, just sit down, maybe you know do a crossword, um, <laughs> all those. <laughs> <laughs> lazy things <laughs> on the road you never have time to really sit down and have breakfast for like two hours so sometimes you have to do that when you're home and then coming back to golf on the let etc um how have you found adjusting to tour life as you said your dad helps massively with mm. the planning and everything but um what have you found going week to week obviously meeting new people players probably some players that you played when you were in amateur haven't seen for a few years that kind of thing uh, what's that been like um I think it's been like fun and uh, I really look forward of like to turning pro my last year of college and so I I think I've just enjoyed um turning pro and and doing like golf by myself and not having even though I love having a team like coming off like being done with college it was just so nice to just think about myself and what I wanted to do and you know how I wanted to dress today or you know stuff like that so um and then just go out and I, I kind of like the feeling of having to like I don't know prove myself a bit or having that sort of pressure I remember I was watching a call like a, I think it was Arnold Palmer Cup we played and Maria Fassi was talking on like a conference call with us and she was saying like it doesn't matter how good you are as an amateur the second you turn pro no one will care anymore and that really stuck to me and so I saw that as like like everything I do like a competition um, and that okay if if no one cares of what I did as an amateur I have to do at least that or better now to have like the same sort of, I don't know, feeling inside. And so knowing that I, I got very like competitive early, went out in my, obviously playing the Sunshine Tour, I think that was really good, but I really went out with uh, with the goal to win every week. And I did that through the whole season. And um, I mean, obviously it worked. <laughs> yeah, but I just really enjoyed it. And I think being on, both the Sunshine Tour first and then moving on to LAT was a really good start of the season and start of my career to really get comfortable with everything that was new. Again, like there's so much new stuff every week and there's still stuff that I don't have a clue about. Um, there's still emails I don't read <laughs> and all of that. So um, it takes some time to really to know everything. But then again, when you turn pro, I feel like like the first couple of weeks, I felt like I don't know everything and I need to know everything so that I can play well. And then I realized, no, I do not. I just have to trust, have people that I trust that can help me. And I think that's been really important for me this year. We'll talk about one of those people who was battling against you last year. Obviously, um, yourself and Maya have both had similar trajectories um, in your career and turning pro at the same time now winning on the LET, having LPGA status, all of those things. Um, but tell me about that intense battle last year that you had in the race to cost El Sol, because obviously you were ahead and then she was ahead and then you were ahead and then she was ahead. It just kind of went back and forth right until the end of the season. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't have, like my goal was never last season to, I mean, at the start of it was never to like win the Order of Merit because I coming in like again, to a new tour and as a pro which was new I had no idea was like how good I was like I needed to play to win that or I didn't even think of that as anything and then I think Maya starting off the season really well and being ahead of me from the start I think you know like we've always done through our amateur careers like if knowing that if she can do something I can do the same thing so that made it very easy and comfortable for me to like go on the chase a little bit like if she can do it I can do it and then I think you know the other way around and 
I'm not speaking for her, but I, I know that she said that it was very nice when I went past her after the Scandi mix. She was like, it's so much attention from this order of merit. <laughs> I need a break. <laughs> um, and I don't think any of us really thought much about it until really the last week. Obviously, we were both very competitive, but it wasn't that important to any of us, I think, until the last week. And, and I think she didn't really care about it either until we were sitting in this, just me guessing, we were sitting in an interview and um, I said something like, yeah, I'm, I'm really going to win this or I'm like, I'm really here to win this. And I think she re- realized that I really saw it as a competition. And so I think after that, she was like, okay, <laughs> game on uh, that was at least my feeling about it because I didn't care about it either that much until that last week because everything everyone was like hyping it up a bit and was like oh my gosh I'm gonna win what are you thinking blah, blah. um and yeah it turned out quite fun you were both quite stressed that week <laughs> I'm not sure I've had a week where you you have both been so stressed when talking to me at the end of the day <laughs> that was definitely that week um but Kind of following on from that, in terms of Swedish golf itself, obviously you both came through um, the Swedish golf ranks. Obviously, Swedish golf is very involved with their golf program, especially their female golf program. You've spoken about how it gave you such a good foundation um, moving forward. Do you definitely think that that has helped you get to where you are right now? And what help do uh, the Swedish team continue to give you? I mean, without having those four or five six years of amateur golf with the national team um and with Frederick and Marcus as coaches I don't think I would be sitting here at all and also having like that high level of golf in the group that I was in um I think that is one of the the big reasons I'm as good as I am today and had the season that I had because we not only like did we play together but they really educated us in like everything in like media with like how like I said in the beginning like really making sure that we knew what we were getting us ourselves into both like going to college what to expect but also like turning pro like how much will it cost like how many hours a week do we have to spend on media and what do we say in this interview and how do we do this or um and also like golf wise but really like getting the whole spectrum of what it's like to being a professional golfer And at the same time, like having so much fun with practice and learning so much, like how to uh, more efficiently practice and get better with everything that we do. I think I still use Frederick Market, my coaches, and I still have contact with um, the Federation now and then. And I know that I can always ask questions and I know that I can. I mean, now I try to like help out as much as I can. Um, I think it it's really fun to like see all the younger girls come up and like um, getting better every year like it's really fun to see that they're doing like the same journey as we did um, and I'm keeping an eye on them <laughs> and because um, I knew what worked for us so it's really interesting to like see how because there's always like new coaches right so just seeing how everyone works and how that works and see what I can learn from from them and vice versa, I guess. Has anyone come up to you and said how you inspire them? Have you had that in the past year? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's quite strange. Like, but it's funny, like, cause there's what it's really like nice for me to hear is that every person has their own like story, which is also kind of strange. Um, like sometimes I feel like I talk about myself and it's not me but it is me <laughs> um but like I know my mom has a, a store so I know that um women come into our score, store and they're like oh I started to play golf because of Lynn and, and I see that she wears this and this and she does this and this I started to do that too uh, so it's it's really fun um and also like quite strange um <laughs> really to be yeah <laughs> I don't know one time where you have had to kind of do an off-the-cuff speech was not too long ago um, in January at an awards ceremony when obviously you won Swedish Newcomer of the Year. What was that like, number one, just kind of 
getting nominated for that award but yeah. then obviously the fact that you ended up winning you had to go up on stage give a speech in front of everybody obviously your family were all there in the room um just talk me through that experience because I imagine you 18 months ago was not kind of not expecting that to happen I don't know um you know there's like a lot of things that happened this year that I would not have expected a year ago and um, yeah just like being nominated is like a, a big deal um I mean because there's I think sports in Sweden is so good in so many different categories. Um, so like for golf to be nominated is just a huge thing. Um, and then obviously it being me was just uh, a very kind gesture, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, going there to the gala was just so nice and getting dressed and, and seeing a lot of people that I know and, and kind of stepping out of the golf world for for an evening at least and I don't know it's just I mean I've only seen this prize giving ceremony on tv before and you know just thinking about while I was sitting there that I was sitting there <laughs> it was just so strange like this is just not happening you know um and um and even more strange to just walk up on that stage and and taking that trophy because uh, it's something else when it's not like a performance when sure if I played really well for a whole week I can like expect myself to having to go up there and you know it makes sense but like having a jury vote for you like compare you to other sports and other individuals it's just it is really strange but it's just like you can't really prepare for it and especially when it's like such a at least for me and in Sweden I think it's such a big thing as an athlete to really get any price on that gala because I think it's more about like there's that there's so many athletes that are so good and it's really difficult to get a price and so yeah I was so nervous like my <laughs> my heart was beating so hard and so fast and I feel like it was like out of my body and yeah just very strange <laughs> but yeah I had to hold a speech um it was okay though it felt all right oh I think I I was so like boosted with adrenaline and I was so nervous that I, I can't even remember what I said um I was just I just knew that I had like three points and it was very important for me to like mention everyone that I wanted to mention by name um so yeah yeah and then you looked over at your parents and nearly cried <laughs> Yeah, I nearly cried. I was like, am I going to cry? I am going to cry if I just let go. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> Obviously, you're in a room full of people's sporting heroes. Did you have a sporting hero? Yeah, I think it was. I can't remember. Like, I didn't, I I'm, I'm, was never, like, a nerd about someone. Like, I didn't, like, have posters of someone in my room or stuff like that. But, like, I think different people have inspired me through like different years when I was really young and I was so into horses and there's a Swedish horse rider that was like one of my idols. I really wanted to be her when I was growing up, um, you know, and then like seventh, eighth, ninth grade, I think music was really big of me for me and I really wanted to like do like musical stuff and um, had a lot of I don't know more like music related uh, idols I guess but I never had like one person that I was like oh my gosh <laughs> this is like my number one person um I think I've always had like people around me that I've managed to look up to in different ways and mm -hmm. um, and just really again like surrounding surrounding myself with good people that I would like to be more ass or and do things that they do um yeah um so do you have any goals that you've set out for the 2023 season yes um <laughs> i obviously want to play the soaring cup that is probably one of my biggest goals this season and ranking wise my goal is to obviously my goal is always to become number one but I'm trying to take it step by step so um I mean getting into the top five this year would be just a great goal um and a great achievement I guess 
and then I always have winning a major in my goals list but I will have that until I manage to win one I guess <laughs> um, so we'll see how long that takes to forever if we ever get there but yeah those are probably the three biggest one I guess moving out of my parents home is one as well <laughs> Um, and yeah, in terms of the Solheim Cup, did you watch that when you were younger? Is that something that has kind of always been there for you as a goal in golf? Yeah, I think I've, I I can't remember. I, I watched it, but what it really stuck to me was like these, is it like a summer video they make every year of like the week? And they always put in some cool music and like there's some, you know, good videos. And those are always so inspiring and motivating um and I remember like looking at those when I was younger and I every time I saw one I was like gosh I really want to be there like I really want to play that's so cool and then in 17 we played the junior sewing cup and being there um, seeing them play their I think it was the first and second day um was just also really cool um to just be able to, you know, talk to them and and be around them and see what they were doing and also seeing like that they did stuff that I could do, um, like it wasn't that far away, you know. Um, I think that was probably the most inspiring at that time, um, just seeing that that could actually be me one day and not feeling like that was too far off. Obviously, you're in Spain right now, and I've seen you've been at Finca a little bit. What do you make of the course around there? Well, I think it's a beautiful place. Um, it's really nice. And obviously the whole clubhouse and, and the practice area and the whole uh, experience when you're there is just really, really nice. And they're super kind and, yeah, takes well, you know, care of us when we're there. Um, I think it will be a great uh, challenge to everyone when when we or they play however it gets um like they could really put up the course difficult they can put it up long if there's wind it's going to be a challenge um this bermuda grass which i don't like <laughs> um but i'm trying to you know get comfortable with the course because if i play that week i i really want to feel like it's my home place um and so i try to play it as much as possible and um, obviously getting used to the grass and the slopes and and um, kind of knowing different tees and stuff. Are you someone who listens to music when you're warming up or are you someone who doesn't listen to anything? Because obviously it depends on different players. Some players listen to loads of music, some players don't listen to anything. Yeah, I used to listen to music when I was practicing and warming up and everything. And then I don't know why I stopped. I just thought that I think it's because I, whenever I work out, I listen to music constantly for two hours. And so having that and golf was just like, it was almost like I, I focus more when I don't have the music because then I obviously hear my thoughts better. Um, and so I, I don't know why I quit, but I just, I think I just did a, a day. Maybe it was because my headphones got lost. I don't know. But for some reason, I just haven't had them for well maybe three two years or something but prior to that I used to listen to music or podcasts for quite a lot when I was practicing um but yeah obviously your birthday is around midsummer in Sweden the fact that you kind of had a holiday around your birthday is that always a special time for you because you're able to kind of meet with your family and friends for that as well as having your birthday at the same time yeah both I guess I feel like it's a being like a kid I hated having my birthday in the summer because everyone went on vacation so I never got to celebrate with anyone it felt (laughs) like um but I think now it's nice like the older I get the the less I care about my birthday so the closer it gets like because every year it's different but the closer it is to midsummer kind of the better because then you could celebrate something, you can celebrate something else, and they can just, you know, jump in and say, it's a birthday today, or what? Um, it doesn't have to be a huge thing, but it's really nice to have it close to midsummer, because then you know, like, 
there's always people celebrating midsummer so like there's it's always a time to um be home and celebrate and and yeah being in the festive vibes i guess okay i'm gonna move on to the quiz now so to round off this episode i have a quick quiz for you <laughs> including yourself eight swedes have one rookie of the year Mm -hmm. So you and seven others, you mm -hmm. now have 60 seconds to name the other seven Swedish players to, to have won L.E.T. Rookie of the Year. Are you ready? Steady, go. Uh, Karen Hedwall? Yes. Dan Nordquist? Yes. Uh, Annika Zernstam? Uh, Lotta Neumann, maybe? Yes, um, that's only was four. that last one? Lotta Neumann? No? No. What is this? Um, Helena Alfredsson? Yes. Um, mm, 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 mm. God, gosh, I'm so stressed. Two more. Just two Half more. the time. Half the time. Um, <laughs> rookie of the year. Madeline won it? No. No? It's older. A couple older and one similar age to you. Younger me. What? Hmm? Younger? She's around your age group. <laughs> <laughs> Five uh, seconds. Gosh, no, I don't know. The others two. So Helen Alfredson, mm. Annika Sorensen, mm. Anna Berg, Louise Stahl, Anna Norkvist. Who's the third person you said? Anna Berg. Anna Berg. Okay. Mm. Uh, mm. Louise Stahl, Anna Norkvist, Caroline Hedwall, and Julia Engstrom. Oh, I didn't know she won that. Mm. Ah, 21? Yeah, <laughs> she knows. She she no was very, very young when she won that. <laughs> yeah, true. All right, shame on me. So there we have it. Lynn Grant full of confidence heading into 2023 after a phenomenal breakthrough season on the Ladies European Tour. Now Lynn heads to Saudi Arabia next after finishing runner-up in Morocco, where she and a stacked field would be competing towards their chunk of the $5 million purse. That's right, $5 million. We'll be back next Wednesday to round up all the action from Jeddah, where we'll also be joined by a very special Solheim Cup guest. It's definitely one you don't want to miss. Until then, we hope you enjoyed episode two of the LET Golf podcast. If you did, please leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Music, or whichever platform you're streaming from. And remember to follow us on socials at LET Golf. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week, guys. Golf Podcast, the official podcast of the Lady.